Hi, today we're going to be looking at the LED boards for the LED ring light project that we had made at JLC PCB. So here they are, this is the panel exactly as we designed it in Proteus and we've got nine individual LED boards per panel. So we've got the front and then we've got the back side. On the rear here you can see I took on the suggestion of removing away some of the solder mass. So we've got the uh, actual gold pad which is the heatsink pad for the LED and we've got some heat sinks which we're going to attach using some thermal pads and you can see that fits really nicely there onto the pad that we've exposed so that looks really good and then on this side is where we've got our LED in the center there we've got a little capacitor and then we've got a header there which is what we're going to use to connect up to the main PCB. So one thing that's worth mentioning is when I originally had this PCB submitted to JLC PCB, you'll recall that I did actually have this rejected because there wasn't quite enough material between the panel and the PCB. And a few people commented in that video that there are some guidelines for how you design the breakouts with the rabbit holes and everything like this. Uh, but they wanted a little bit more material. I think they said at least four millimeters between the panel and the PCB. And this is what I came up with. But they were mentioning basically that sometimes with the router cutter it's not quite as controlled as some of the other processors in the PCB manufacturer. I don't really understand what process they're using but you can see an example of it just here. So it's quite subtle but you can see on this left hand side here it's almost like the router cutter is overshot slightly. There's less material here than there is on this side and also you can see just here there's a little bit of an extra rounding out here that you wouldn't necessarily expect. On this one you can see the cutter's just veered up very slightly. You can see it's just rounded out very slightly at the top. So I'm not really sure what process they use for the router cutter process. Obviously the holes are registered absolutely fine. And if you have any slots in a pad for a component that are through hole plated, those always come out absolutely fine as well. So it's just this final router cutter. But for some reason it does seem to be prone to some errors. And I've heard other stories of that being a problem for some people. So just something to bear in mind, if you do have some of these slots that are unplated, it could be that they're registered very slightly incorrectly or that they uh, you know, could be subject to some very slight errors here like we can see on this slot here. So what I plan to do today is to solder up all of the LEDs that I've got. I only ordered 12 of these Cree LEDs from Mauser. That's enough to make three ring lights. And I also got 12 of the lenses and these look pretty good. They do look like they fit very nicely into the holes in the PCB. These have a little adhesive pad on this side that you can peel away. But when you put it into the positioning holes you can see it's very centrally aligned. That gold pad you can see being reflected in the reflector. And to assemble these LEDs onto it Chris Ward from Solder King did send me through some new solder paste. So that's his business card if you're interested but he sent through some new bismuth solder. So this is the low temperature solder, which I really quite like using for components like these that could be quite temperature sensitive. And you can see here, this was literally just made the other day. So big thanks to Chris Ward. And we're gonna start soldering up these boards now. Now the first thing that I like to always do with these boards is give them a clean before we do any soldering. So we're gonna use some flux clean and we'll just get it onto a little piece of tissue and just clean up the side that we're going to apply the paste to. So I've taped the PCB to the stencil after aligning it only at the top so that we can fold up the stencil once we've applied the paste and that will mean that we get a nice clean finish. And rather than apply a bead of solder paste all the way along the top and try and do it in one go, I'm probably going to work these LEDs individually because they're quite spaced out and once you've put the paste on here there's not really any easy way to get it back into a syringe. Now rather than the hot plate, today we're going to be using the Yeehaw 853A and this is going to do the majority of the heating. I'll probably need to add a little bit of hot air from the hot air gun but the reason why I'm using this is because on the PCBs themselves we've got the tiny little vias underneath the heatsink pad of the LED 
and if any paste happens to creep through on this it will just wick onto the other side and there'll be a little bit of a blob of solder potentially. If I use it on the hot plate there's a good chance that we're going to end up with a blob on the hot plate that we can't get rid of. So this is the tool of choice today. And a new addition to the lab we've got a proper fume extractor now so this is a quick 6601 fume extractor and I'm really impressed with this device. It's actually very quiet in comparison to a lot of the fume extractors you can get. It uses a brushless DC motor. It's got a little controller here for adjusting the speed of the unit but it seems to do a really good job so I'll probably end up doing a little video on this uh, but yeah we're going to add that in just to get rid of some of the fumes. So there's our LEDs all soldered up. Everything is nicely lined up on the top side and on the rear you can see we've barely had any bleed through of the solder paste so I'm quite happy with how that's turned out. Let's quickly check that all of the LEDs are working and we're just using the bench power supply set to about 6.5 volts and 20 milliamps. So yeah that all looks good. So now let's see if we can actually break these out of the panel without causing any damage to the PCB and yeah that's breaking really quite nicely. Obviously if we had components close to the edge we'd need to be quite careful of those that we didn't break the solder joints but that's come out quite nicely. We'll probably want to tidy that up with a file once we've tested that this actually all works at full current. So let's try getting one of these lenses in place. That's pressed down nicely and then we've got the heat sink here with the adhesive pad already on it. Let's see if we can peel the back the backing and let's try and get that nicely lined up. There we go that's our LED assembly. Let's power it up and see how bright it is. Right so I put some wires onto this PCB and connected it up to the bench power supply. For reference in the lab at the moment we're at about 4400 lux with the Unity UT383. This meter is quite nice and relatively inexpensive. I think it does also have Bluetooth and uses the serial port profile so you can just stream out lux data every second which is quite nice if you wanted to use it for data logging. So that's just a reference point. Let's power up the LED at the 700 milliamps which is the maximum that we expect to drive this LED. So that's at about 700 milliamps and that is extremely bright. I think probably the easiest way to measure this is let's hold the LED about 20 centimeters above the meter which is the distance that we expect for the microscope. And you can see there We've got the times 10 here, so we're actually at 25,000 lux with just the one LED. Now bear in mind that we're going to have four of these and daylight, uh, bright sunlight is somewhere around 110,000 lux. With the four LEDs, in fact I've just aligned it slightly better and we're right up there at 35,000, we will be exceeding bright sunlight with these four LEDs on at this distance. So that's pretty cool. Let's have a look at what it actually looks like under the microscope. So here is our standard ring light with 3.5 times zoom and we don't normally notice too much trouble at this particular zoom level other than the fact that because the ring light is exactly over the PCB we get quite a few reflections on the board. Now if we add in our new LED at the right height you can see that first of all improves the reflections that are coming back because we're now slightly at an angle but also we've got rid of quite a lot of graininess that we could see in the image. Now at higher zooms this is where we get less light into the camera so if we zoom in all of the way and so that's how it looks like with our standard ring light. Now if we add in our new LED you can see that significantly better. So the overall image has brightened up and as a result we've also got rid of some of the graininess from some of the integral action that the camera is trying to do. Now just for curiosity's sake I wanted to see how bright this LED actually goes. Now for reference for an LED the current to brightness 
is a non-linear relationship. It typically has a gradient that starts to decrease as the current increases, and so you get less light than you would expect if, for example, you doubled the current. So we're expecting to drive at about 700 milliamps, but we can actually drive this LED at 3 amps. So let's have a look at what the difference in brightness is if we increase the current all the way up to 3 amps. So I've got the LED positioned 250 millimeters away from the sensor. So let's turn up the current. So 500 milliamps, 1 amp, 1.5 amps, and 3 amps. So I'm quite happy with how these LED boards have turned out. The light output is really nice. This lens is doing a great job of giving us a nice soft beam. It does have a bit of a hot spot towards the middle, but that's absolutely fine for our microscope use. And the colour is very natural indeed. Now this LED has been on for about 15 minutes now at 700 milliamps. And we seem to be settling at about 46, 47 degrees C, which is quite an acceptable temperature. Obviously the dye is going to be a little bit warmer than that, probably, um, you know, 20 degrees higher or so, but certainly not excessive. So this looks to be quite an adequate thermal solution if we're happy with this drive current. Now also, in terms of the colour rendering index, in the lab, I think we've got um, LED lights with a CRI of about 80. And the area that LEDs tend to struggle is more towards the red and the orange area because they have a blue LED dye, sometimes UV, but they use a phosphor to generate some of these warmer colours. And that is a little bit more difficult to do than the areas towards the blue and the green. So you can see here that the lab lights are already doing quite well. We can see quite good difference in colour between these colours here. If we add in our LED, you can suddenly see this orange is quite different to this tone up here. You can still see these two quite well, but particularly on the oranges, it seems to really show up the differences. So, you know, this is really quite nice. Not too much of an issue for our PCBs. It's probably more important if we had this in the lab in general but it will help us identify any colours if they're on uh, resistors and that kind of thing a little bit easier. So I'm pretty happy with how these LED boards have turned out. In the next video, we will look at the main boards again and see what JLC PCB had to say about those devices that I found to be faulty. Also, if you had a look at the community posts, you may have seen that I have designed a case for this, a little chassis, that we're going to 3D print and actually make it look a bit more like a device rather than some PCBs just hanging off the lens on the microscope. So hopefully you found the video interesting. Thank you to JLC PCB for these boards and also to Chris Ward for the solder that we use to assemble these. And until next time, thanks for watching.